Priority at the summit and the UN stage will be garnering global support to establish peace on the Korean Peninsula. Our package starts us off. President Moon Jae-in and U.S. President Donald Trump are set to meet next Monday on the 23rd for their ninth bilateral summit on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly in New York. The two sides plan to discuss measures to achieve complete denuclearization and lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula and various ways to strengthen the South Korea-U.S. alliance as well as regional issues. According to a senior Blue House official, North Korea is expected to top their agenda, especially with signs that nuclear negotiations between Pyongyang and Washington will resume soon. But the official also says they will likely have more than North Korea on their plates. For one, there's a trade dispute between Seoul and Tokyo. That prompted the South Korean government's decision to end its military intelligence sharing pact with Japan, fueling concerns over the future of the trilateral alliance. And amid rising concerns of a rift in Seoul-Washington ties, the two sides have to settle some pressing matters like how much South Korea will have to pay next year for stationing U.S. troops in the country. The rest of his itinerary at the U.N. General Assembly will also be centered around his peace initiative when he sits down with other world leaders and U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres. And President Moon will call for the member nation's continued support for the peace process through his keynote speech on the 24th. And with the president of the International Olympic Committee, President Moon will discuss the formation of unified inter-Korean teams for the Tokyo Olympics and their joint entrance at the opening ceremony. He will also bring up the two Koreas co-hosting of the 2032 Summer Games. This was among the agreements made by the leaders of the two Koreas when they met in Pyongyang last year. President Moon is the first South Korean president to attend the UN General Assembly for three years straight, while his main focus will be gathering support from the international community for his peace efforts on the Korean Peninsula. He will also work to increase Korea's contribution to resolving global issues like climate change. Park Hee-jun, Irang News. And South Korea's National Security Council will be making preparations to ensure that the summit with President Trump in New York leads to concrete measures to strengthen the alliance. In a regular meeting today, chaired by National Security Advisor Chung Yong, council members agreed to back President Moon's efforts to garner international support for the Korean Peninsula's complete denuclearization and permanent peace. They also assessed the political and economic impacts of the attack on Saudi Arabia's oil facility facilities and how Korea can respond. U.S. President Donald Trump has appointed Robert O'Brien a special envoy for hostage affairs to replace John Bolton as his new security advisor. Not much is known about the new NSC chief, but experts say there won't be much change in Trump's current North Korea policy. Our Lee ji has more. Not much is known about President Trump's new national security advisor Robert O'Brien and his views on foreign policy. But the general consensus seems to be that he will cause less friction in the White House on North Korea. Politico, citing a former official at the Defense Ministry, said that O'Brien might be just as hawkish as his predecessor John Bolton as they were at the United Nations together back in 2005. But the official added that O'Brien is certainly not as willing to start a fight. Bolton had angered North Korea on numerous occasions and put the talks at risk by trying to use the Libyan model on the north when Pyongyang's nuclear program is much more developed. Politico also cited another person close to the new advisor to say that O'Brien is definitely hawkish and in the same school as Bolton on Iran, but that he is more of a team player and more compliant with Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's demands. O'Brien's closeness to Secretary Pompeo is widely known, and many speculate that there will be less friction between him and Pompeo on the denuclearization policy for North Korea. But Voice of America suggests that O'Brien might not be playing much of an active role on North Korea. While O'Brien was involved in a number of issues involving Afghanistan, former State Department Policy Planning Director Mitchell Race told VOA that Secretary Pompeo and Special Representative Steve Began are expected to continue taking the lead on Pyongyang. It added, former White House Coordinator for Arms Control and Weapons of Mass Destruction Gary Samor said that O'Brien doesn't have strong views on countries like North Korea, so he could be more flexible in pursuing a diplomatic approach with the North.
An expert on American politics, James Kim, said O'Brien's appointment is unlikely to cause any major shift in policy toward North Korea. O'Brien is currently a diplomat, so he is expected to have a more balanced view compared to Bolton. But the Trump administration's North Korea policy wasn't heavily influenced by Bolton in the first place. Thus, the approach and tactics won't change due to a change in one person. The general view is that the main points of contention between the two sides will still be on sanctions alleviation and security guarantees. Lee ji Arirang News. It's been a year since South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un met for their third summit in Pyongyang. South Korea held an event this morning to mark the anniversary, but North Korea hasn't shown any particular response. Here's our Unification Ministry correspondent, Oh Jong-hee. In September 2018, South Korean President Moon Jae-in flew to Pyongyang for his third summit with Kim Jong-un. And that's where the two Koreas came up with the Pyongyang Joint Declaration, which stipulated a wide range of inter-Korean projects, from lowering military tensions to fostering economic cooperation, resolving humanitarian issues and boosting cultural and sports exchanges. Fast forward a year. After the Hanoi summit between Pyongyang and Washington ended without a deal, inter-Korean relations are at a deadlock, and the promises of the Pyongyang Joint Declaration remain unfulfilled. Still, South Korea held an event on Thursday at its Office of Inter-Korean Dialogue to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the summit in Pyongyang. The country's unification minister stressed that tensions on the Korean peninsula have eased considerably and South Korea will keep working with both Pyongyang and Washington. North Korea has recently announced that it's willing to resume negotiations with the U.S. in late September. South Korea will closely coordinate with the U.S. and always keep open its channel for dialogue with the North so that North Korea-U.S. working-level negotiations can succeed. The need to hold reunions of families separated by the Korean War was highlighted as well. We're doing everything we can to arrange video and face-to-face -face reunions as well as enable South Korean families to exchange letters with their North Korean relatives and visit their hometowns in the North. But it seems it'll take a while until South Korea kickstarts work with the North on these inter-Korean projects. On Thursday, North Korea did not release any reports or show any response about the anniversary of the summit. Observers point out that the North has recently been sending fewer messages to South Korea, which could imply it first wants to focus on its negotiations with the U.S. Oh Jong-hee, Arirang News. Also signed between the two Koreas last September in Pyongyang was the comprehensive military agreement aiming to reduce inter-Korean military tensions. Our Choi Jong-yoon now tells us more on the progress and the setbacks over the past year and what tasks lie ahead. A lot has changed on the Korean Peninsula since the signing of the comprehensive military agreement on September 19, 2018. A trial removal of nearly a dozen frontline guard posts on both sides of the demilitarized zone was carried out, as well as the removal of weaponry and troops there. The two Koreas have also disarmed the joint security area in Panmunjom and set up ground, air and maritime buffer zones along the border. A no-fly zone has been imposed covering 10 to 40 kilometers from the military demarcation line. And Seoul's defense ministry has been trying to negotiate with the North about expanding the zone to cover the Hangang River estuary. The two Koreas have also carried out a joint survey of the estuary's waterway with the aim of providing the free passage of civilian vessels by sharing the area. They've also conducted demining operations at Arrowhead Ridge inside the DMZ, site to one of the fiercest battles during the Korean War for the excavation of troop remains. Despite this, the two Koreas still have a long way to go to fully implement the agreement, especially after the series of firings of new weapons by the North since May amid slow progress in the regime's denuclearization talks with the U.S. It has raised criticism about the agreement's effectiveness, stemming from the ambiguous interpretation of the agreement's term which says the two Koreas should refrain from provocative acts. Seoul's defense ministry has reiterated that the firings don't constitute a violation of the agreement, but admitted they run counter to the spirit of the deal. 
It's a stretch to say the firing is a violation. Since the deal did not state officially that launch is a provocative act against the South, the nature of the launches, taking into consideration their flight distance and direction also indicated they were more like a test firings rather than a postulation pertaining to a serious threat. Further discussions include North Korea's acknowledgement of the northern limit line, the disputed maritime demarcation line in the West Sea where the Koreas have agreed to establish a shared fishing ground. They also need to hold more talks on the joint excavation of war remains, currently being carried out exclusively by the South after the North failed to respond. Choi j o n g y u n Arirang News. South Korea and Japan's top diplomats for Asian affairs will meet in Tokyo on Friday to discuss a possible meeting between the two countries' foreign ministers. Kim Jong-un, Director General for Asian and Pacific Affairs, will have talks with his counterpart Shigeki Takizaki for the first time since Takizaki took up his post earlier this month. The pair are expected to discuss the possible meeting between Foreign Minister Kang k y u n g h w a and her new Japanese counterpart Toshimitsu Motegi at the UN General Assembly next week. More than two months have passed since Japan imposed strict export restrictions on South Korea and people here in Korea are just as committed to their boycott of Japanese products. Travel to Japan has also dropped significantly with the number of South Korean tourists to the neighboring country in August seeing the steepest on-year fall on record. Our Am Ji-young has more. The number of South Korean tourists to Japan plummeted in August. According to the Japan National Tourism Organization, less than 309,000 South Koreans visited Japan in August, 48 percent lower in the same month last year. And many South Koreans are not only refraining from visiting Japan, but also boycotting Japanese products. This retailer, one of the largest in South Korea, has posters with the words No Japan displayed around its store. For more than two months, South Koreans have been boycotting Japanese products to express their anger over Tokyo's export curves on Seoul. The public mood shows no signs of changing anytime soon, with the boycott of anything made in Japan still gaining steam. Since July, imported Japanese goods have all but disappeared from this supermarket. When I shop for groceries these days, I try not to buy Japanese products. Japanese beer, once the most popular imported beer in South Korea, is now nowhere to be seen on the shelves. In August, imports of Japanese beer slumped at a staggering 97 percent from a year earlier. According to data released this week by the Korea Customs Service, only 223,000 U.S. dollars of beer was imported from Japan. Beer is not the only product severely impacted by the boycott. According to Seoul's trade ministry on Wednesday, sales of Japanese cars in South Korea plunged nearly 60 percent on year in August. The boycott has had a big impact on some staple Japanese products. Finding an alternative to these products is not that hard. This means the boycott not only hit Japanese beer or cars, but also clothing brands like Uniqlo. Japanese clothing brand Uniqlo has been forced to close four of its stores in South Korea since the boycott started in July. Most people in Seoul expect the anti-Japan boycott to rumble on. I don't think it will end anytime soon. My parents and my friends are also boycotting Japanese products. Some even denounced the Abe administration in Tokyo. In my opinion, it was imprudent for Prime Minister Abe to impose export curbs on South Korea in the first place. The problems between our two countries could have been resolved through a dialogue rather than economic retaliation. However, experts warn the prolonged boycott campaign is negatively affecting Japanese and South Korean firms. And there are calls for the two governments to move toward reconciliation and cooperation for the sake of both of their economies. o m Ji-young, Arirang News. In other news, South Korea remains on high alert for African swine fever since the second case of the disease was confirmed yesterday at a pig farm near the inter-Korean border. Despite no new cases being reported since then, the government does plan to cull around 15,000 pigs from farms in the area as a precaution. 
A nationwide lockdown on pig farms was lifted this morning, but there's still a ban on pork shipments from six tightly controlled zones for the next three weeks. The government has also temporarily closed the DMZ Peace Trail in Paju and Toron. The origin of the outbreak is still unknown. African swine fever is highly contagious and fatal to pigs, but does not affect humans. As concerns grow over a slowing global economy, the U.S. Fed has slashed interest rates for the second time this year. South Korea's central bank chief said this morning that the rate cut was expected and that it won't significantly impact the BOK's own rate policy for now. Yoon Jung-bin tells us more. Following a two-day policy meeting, the U.S. Federal Reserve on Wednesday cut its benchmark interest rate by 25 basis points to a range of 1.75 percent to 2 percent. The cut comes just seven weeks after the Fed went ahead in July with its first rate cut in 11 years. Today, we decided to lower interest rates. As I will explain shortly, we took this step to help keep the U.S. economy strong in the face of some notable developments and to provide insurance against ongoing risks. Fed policymakers voted 7 to 3 in favor of lowering rates. With a lower unemployment rate and improving consumer sentiment, some saw the U.S. economy as on the road to recovery, while others focused more on downside risks, such as the U.S.-China trade spat. I think the effect of the rate cut this time around is uh, surely, surely the pressure, I mean, surely trigger uh, the inflation pressure goes, goes up, uh, reaching the 2% 2 of the Fed uh, target rate. And also for business fixed investment, rate cut is quite a good news for U.S. economy and also the exports. At a press conference Wednesday, Powell says further cuts would be appropriate if the economy does turn downward, but suggested he doesn't think the Fed needs to keep cutting rates. The Fed's Monetary Policy Committee was also divided over further rate cuts. Of all 17 policymakers, seven expect a third rate cut this year, five see the rate remaining unchanged, while another five expect a hike. However, President Trump, who has been pressuring the Fed to take more sweeping cuts, slammed the decision saying Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and other Fed policymakers had again failed to meet his expectations. Bank of Korea Governor Lee jae said the Fed's rate cut happened as the market had predicted. Lee told reporters on his way to work Thursday morning that the decision overnight would not significantly change the BOK's monetary policy. When it comes to rate cuts by the Bank of Korea, Lee said it's important to monitor external risks, such as the U.S.-China trade war and rising tensions in the Middle East. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. There have been numerous delays over the years in returning to South Korean control. Military installations now being used by U.S. forces. With the South Korean presidential office calling for more urgency, the U.S. military says it's making progress. Kim ji reports. U.S. forces Korea says it's ready to promptly return some of its military bases in the country as requested by the South Korean government. In a statement Wednesday, the USFK said 15 of its 26 military facilities in South Korea have already been cleared out, which includes four sites specifically requested by Seoul. Their Shea Range, Camp Eagle and Long and parcels of Camp Market. The USFK also said five parcels of the Yongsan garrison in Seoul are ready for transfer. A South Korean military source said it sees the move as a preemptive measure amid speculations that Seoul's request for the early return of the bases could be used as a bargaining chip in defense cost-sharing talks in which Seoul and Washington are slated to hold later this month. The debate over who should be responsible for the costs of clearing up polluted base sites has been widely viewed by local media outlets as a reason for the slow return. A crucial factor the source specifically pointed out was not mentioned in the recent USFK statement. Meanwhile, South Korea's Minister of Foreign Affairs Kang byung hwa is scheduled to tour Camp Humphreys and Wusan Air Base on Friday. She used to meet with USFK Commander Robert Abrams and U.S. Ambassador Harry Harris. Their gathering comes amid heightened frustrations between Seoul and Washington over the former's decision to withdraw from a military intel sharing pact with Japan due to a loss of trust in Tokyo. It's believed Washington sees the termination of the accord as a move that undermines the trilateral security cooperation in Northeast Asia, which is vital to counter nuclear provocations from North Korea and China's ongoing military development. Kim Jian, Arirang News. 
South Korea and the United States will hold a two-day high-level defence talks in Seoul starting next Thursday. The Defence Ministry says Seoul's Deputy Defence Minister Chong seok Kwan and U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence for East Asia Haino Klink will head the 16th Korea-U.S. Integrated Defence Dialogue. Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, the transition of wartime operational control and ways to strengthen and expand ROK-US alliance will likely take a center stage. The biannual meeting is the first such meeting since South Korea ended a military intel sharing pact or JISOMIA with Japan. If you're in Korea, you'll soon have a great chance to immerse yourself in art. The annual Korea Art Week will kick off its fifth edition next Wednesday with a lot of pieces up for sale. Our Imin Sun has the details. The two-week-long Korea Art Week starts on September 25th and looks to encourage people to get closer to the art. Previous events had focused on exchanges and networking among artists, but this year's event aims to encourage visitors to participate themselves and enjoy art. Some 200 art museums and galleries across the country, including National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, are taking part in Korea Art Week and are offering discounted admission and special programs. Museums will also offer sideline events called Night at the Museum, ranging from music performances and film screenings to cooking and art and craft classes. In addition to free admissions to our museums, we'll offer various different things including a novel reading event, an outdoor marketplace and a classical music performance. Since it's autumn, I hope many people enjoy Art Week. The signature program is the art travel program in which participants can check out several art galleries in a single day. A total of 12 art travel programs are offered in eight cities, including Seoul, Daejeon, Cheongju, and Busan. The arts tour was the most popular program during last year's Art Week, so we doubled the size of the program and extended the area to include regional cities beyond Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province. Four walking tours in Seoul and two in Daegu and Busan are offered free of charge. There are also six bus tour programs, which cost between 2,001 and 10,001, or around 2 to 8 US dollars per person. Also, to encourage people to not only enjoy art, but to buy and own art pieces, a number of art marketplaces and an art fair will be held. The 18th Korea International Art Fair runs from September 26th to 29th at the COEX Convention Hall in southern Seoul, with over 170 participating art galleries from Korea and other countries. Six art marketplaces in five cities will also offer artwork, mostly by Korean artists, at a relatively low price. Most of the prices will be under 2 million won, or about 1,700 US dollars. At the marketplace, visitors can also participate in talk shows with artists or enjoy music performances. Lee min Sun, Arirang News. South Korea's science minister met with the heads of local semiconductor firms and experts to discuss ways to improve South Korea's competitiveness in the non-memory chip sector. Our Choi si young brings us the highlights. In April, the South Korean government announced it would foster the non-memory chip industry as one of Korea's three sectors of new economic growth, the other two being future cars and biohealth. On Wednesday, the science minister talked with local firms face-to-face -face on why the government is so determined to nurture a first mover that can compete globally in the non-memory chip sector. Artificial intelligence isn't something we can choose to have in the future. It's with us as we speak, and we need to act quickly to embrace it. The advanced non-memory chip will help us do that. Advanced non-memory chips work best with AI technologies, such as the Internet of Things, to make communication between objects possible. The science minister said South Korea should reduce its dependence on its world-leading memory chip sector and sharpen its competitive edge in the non-memory industry. Some local firms said the government needs to support them in order to achieve such goals. The government should help us do what we can do best now, rather than do something that's likely to take time such as localizing key technologies. That way, we grow stronger and contribute more to South Korea's increasing foothold in the global market. 
South Korea is far behind world leaders in non-memory chips like Intel, but experts say the government and local firms could quickly narrow that gap with the right strategy and funding. Choi Seung, Arirang News. It looks like the mystery surrounding a serial murder case from the 1980s in Korea could be solved after all. The police was able to crack a lead in the case thanks to a huge jump in DNA analysis technology. Our Won jong Hwan has the story. 30 years after a string of murders in Hwasong City, the South Korean police have announced that they now have a strong lead in the case. The investigation team held a press briefing on Thursday, revealing details related to the country's worst serial murder case. They said they have initially identified a prime suspect after the National Forensic Service found that DNA collected from the underwear of one of the victims matched the DNA of the suspect. The police say they have also found a DNA match for two other victims of the serial killing. So far, we have been informed that the DNA from the suspect matches in three of the murder cases and the investigation is currently underway. The police are yet to find any new evidence in the other cases. But DNA technology seems to have played a key role identifying the suspect, who is involved in at least one of the deaths of 10 women who were raped and brutally killed in rural parts of Hwasong between 1986 and 1991. The police said as the technology has developed significantly compared to the 1980s, they decided to send some of their material evidence to the state's forensic agency back in July to request thorough DNA analysis. And they plan to continue their investigation until the public knows the truth. But we'll continue to conduct DNA assessments with the National Forensic Service and will thoroughly investigate the connection between the prime suspect and the serial murders through detailed analysis of the investigation record and the related persons involved. The suspect, who is in his 50s, is currently in prison for a similar crime. He has denied the allegations from the first investigation. But even if the suspect turns out to be the murderer in the Hwasong case, he will not be punished for those crimes as the statute of limitations expired in April 2006. The crime received a lot of attention when it was made into the movie Memories of Murder in 2003. More than 2 million police officers, a record number of a single case were mobilized to investigate the murders. And over 20,000 people were investigated for those murders, a figure that hasn't been broken since. Won Jong-hwan, Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in, shortly after returning from a UN session in New York next week, will sit down with Bulgarian Prime Minister Boyko Borisov next Friday. They will discuss ways to strengthen relations in trade, investment and energy. Borisov will be the first Bulgarian PM to visit Korea and will be in Seoul for three days from next Wednesday. America's top official on East Asia is sounding positive about the idea of holding reunions for Korean Americans and their long-lost families in North Korea. The Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Affairs, David Stilwell, told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Wednesday that such reunions would be a, quote, great idea, adding he will relay the message to the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began. Stilwell was responding to Democratic Congressman Brad Sherman, who suggested in the hearing that the Trump administration should pursue a reunion, saying nearly 100,000 Korean Americans have relatives in the North that they haven't seen since the war. Samsung Electronics is expected to consolidate its leading position in the global DRAM market this year. A report by IHS Markets projects the firm to hold 47% of the global DRAM market share in the third quarter, widening its lead over second place SK Hynix. Samsung saw its market share grow in the first half of the year and held 43% of the market share in Q2. The tech giant is also expected to maintain its leading position in NAND flash memory chips in the third quarter, with 39% of global market share. Swedish teenage climate activist Greta Thunberg has urged US lawmakers to listen to scientists' warning of climate change. She made the plea in a short but direct message before a US congressional hearing on Wednesday. 
The 16-year-old has been in Washington since last week to join activists in building support for a global climate strike and to press U.S. lawmakers to take action. Thunberg also met with former U.S. President Barack Obama on Tuesday, who described the teenager as one of the planet's greatest advocates. That has been your three-minute news flash. It was a relatively cool day and some regions marked the lowest temperature this season. Certainly will be good to have an extra layer handy. For more details, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Centre. Michelle. Now we had nice bright autumn weather today, but starting tomorrow afternoon we are expecting some cloud cover and some of the southern regions could even be overcast. And we are definitely looking ahead to some rain into the weekend as the season's 17th typhoon Tapa has developed in the seas far to the south and it's expected to pass through the waters to Korea southeast this weekend. And the southern regions will be most affected with strong rainstorms starting Saturday, which will influence the rest of the country on Sunday through Monday. And now, depending on the size and its trajectory, the amount of precipitation will vary. Now, with that in mind, let's have a look at our readings for tomorrow. The morning will be a few degrees higher than today, but still you would want to dress in layers as it will be a chilly morning. Seoul and most places will see readings around 15 to 20 degrees Celsius when you wake up. And into the day, the mercury is expected to rise into the mid-20s. Seoul marking up to 25 degrees, while Busan hits up to 26. Now I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That will do it for this edition of Adirang News. Thank you, as always, for watching. News in Depth is next.